Welcome to Superior Capsule Reconstruction, a lecture delivered at the International Shoulder Arthroscopy course in Munich, November 27th, 2019. My name's Professor Duncan Tennant, Consultant Orthopaedic Surgeon in the Shoulder Unit at St George's Hospital, London. Let's start by clarifying what we mean by superior capsule reconstruction. The superior capsule is a continuation of the capsule that we're all familiar with, which goes all around the joint. In its superior portion, running from the glenoid to the insertion of the rotator cuff at the footprint, it is thickened and its role is to prevent superior migration. When the superior cuff is deficient, a technique has been described for inserting a graft from the glenoid to the greater tuberosity, coupling it to the rest of the rotator cuff and helping to keep the humeral head down as the shoulder moves. Why are we considering superior capsule reconstruction? We're all aware that superior rotator cuff tears are a problem if it is not possible to repair them. There is universally pain and a loss of function as it is not possible to keep the humeral head centered in flexion and abduction. There is often also some loss of external rotation. There are a number of options available for the treatment of these tears, however they are limited. It is possible to consider some form of partial repair or margin convergence with or without reattachment to the humeral uh, head. However, the results of these are somewhat unpredictable. It is also possible to consider a patch, whether this be some form of polypropylene or a biological patch. But again, in most hands, these results are also unpredictable and the results are not very satisfactory as the tears get larger. Tendon transfer may also be an option, and the standard one at the moment is latissimus dorsi transfer. However, the evidence suggests that they don't do so well in the patients over 60 years, and that 25% of the patients are not satisfied after the procedure. And despite this picture of JP Warner uh, wearing the standard post-operative brace, in which he looks very happy, I can assure you that most of my patients hate the experience. I therefore feel that in patients over the age of 60, in my hands, it's not a viable option. Another option may well be reverse shoulder arthroplasty, and there is no doubt that this does have good results. However, I have anxieties in patients who don't have arthritis, who are often more active, and I'm certainly not comfortable uh, putting an arthroplasty into a patient under the age of 70 as I think that they're going to start to wear it out and we're going to see problems in the long term. I mentioned before the role of the reconstructed superior capsule in preventing humeral head migration and stabilizing the shoulder. And you can see here in this cadaveric model how nicely it does it. If you then section the graft and start to move the shoulder, the effect becomes more obvious. It is worth knowing a little bit about the background of superior capsule reconstruction and all the work of any note has come from Tiruhisa Mahata in Japan. His first study was a biomechanical analysis which demonstrated very much what you saw in the previous video. In the middle you can see the translation of five six uh, millimeters with a supraspinatus tear and translation with a superior capsule reconstruction being very much comparable to that uh, in the intact shoulder. He then went on to demonstrate that the results were improved if you then repaired the reconstructed superior capsule to the anterior and posterior cuff, uh, which he described as creating a capsular continuity, but is also recognized as reconstructing the force couples. Mahata then went on to publish clinical results, and in his first paper in 2013, 
he reported on 24 shoulders in 23 patients with clearly significant improvements in function. What is impressive about this paper is that his follow-up was 34 months, which is very different to a lot of the papers that we see reporting small numbers with very short follow-up. He then went on to publish a larger series, which included not only those that had healed, but those which had failed, demonstrating very reasonable results, even when the superior capsule re-tears. What impress is impressive here, again, is that he has 72 cases followed up for 30 months, with a minimum of 12 months. But it's also worth noting his age range, which is 43 to 82 years. His final initial paper demonstrated an even larger cohort, demonstrating very similar results uh, to those we've seen previously. Unsurprisingly, a lot of other authors have jumped on the bandwagon, and this initial paper from the United States demonstrated uh, only 45% complete healing on MRI uh, review of 59 patients at one year, however they quoted success at 70%, but there were no other uh, recorded outcome measures. Alan Hirahara presented a two-year follow-up, but of only nine cases, showing significant improvement in the ACES score and pain scores, and suggested on ultrasound that there was some neovascularization of the tendon. My personal data is not dissimilar. My first series of patients with a minimum of one year follow-up uh, was 14 cases, of which nine were counted as a success, with significant improvement in the Oxford score, which ranges from zero to 48 at maximum, with a minimum clinically important difference of six, one can see that an improvement of 19 is far beyond this. There was not much of a gain in external rotation, but this is to be expected as the infraspinatus has to be intact. Five of the cases failed, of which two were heavy smokers and three were revisions from previous failed rotator cuff surgery. In some senses, this isn't surprising as the patient has already declared, first of all, that they failed biologically as their rotator cuff was torn. They then failed to biologically heal from a previous rotator cuff tear, and therefore it would be a bit of a leap to expect anyone to biologically heal from a further operation. My indications for the procedure have developed over the last few years, but are now very strict. They have to be under 75, with an irreparable supraspinatus, but an intact or repairable infraspinatus and subscapularis. There must not be any evidence of arthritis, and they certainly must be a non-smoker. If they do smoke, I thoroughly recommend that they stop prior to the surgery and explain very, very clearly why they need to do this. Superior capsule reconstruction is quite a complicated operation and takes between an hour and a half and two hours with a good team. It can, however, be broken down into a number of fairly basic steps, which you can see on the slide above. The first step is to prepare the bone and the soft tissue. This is bone being prepared to a bleeding surface to allow for healing. There's then the insertion of the glenoid anchors followed by the medial row cuff anchors, then measurement for the graft. The graft is then prepared loaded onto the glenoid anchors, secured onto the glenoid. There is then the lateral side rotator cuff repair and then margin convergence to the infraspinatus. It is worth saying a few words about the setup. I prefer to do these in the lateral decubitus as it opens the bursal space and makes it a lot easier to manage the sutures as they can be laid down. Have the pump pressure low. This shouldn't be a problem if flow control is managed. When you're putting the graft in, put a swab on the skin. This reduces the uh, microbial load on the graft. You do need at least one assistant, preferably two, 
and you'll need somebody to write on the board the graft sizes, and we'll see this in a minute. You do need to be prepared to make a number of portals, although most of these are percutaneous. The only cannula is used in the lateral working portal. The standard view is from the posterior portal. You then need to be familiar with the Nevaeusa portal, which is used for the insertion of the glenoid anchors and a traction suture if you want to use one. You then need an anterior portal for working and parking sutures, a posterior accessory portal, which is used for the posterior sutures, and the superlateral portal, which is used for insertion of the medial row tuberosity anchors. The first step is preparation of the glenoid. And the first step in this is removal of all the soft tissues from the superior glenoid. And once the surface is prepared, it needs to be decorticated with a shaver or a burr. Similarly, the greater tuberosity needs to be prepared down to a bleeding surface throughout its whole contact area. The next step is the insertion of the glenoid anchors. I use the 3.9 knotless corkscrew anchors as I found that the previously used suture tacks have a tendency to pull out in softer bone. I work from anterior to posterior through the Nevaeusa portal. The advantage of the 3.9 knotless is it comes with this fish mouth drill guide which makes it easier to control the position and they screw in very securely. The next step is the insertion of the humeral anchors. This is the medial row of a speed bridge technique and it's just important to make sure that the anchors are as far forward and as far posterior as you can make them.
once all the anchors are in place, you have to start to prepare for the graft. The first step in this is measuring the distances between the anterior and posterior glenoid anchors, and then between the anterior glenoid anchor and the anterior humeral medial row anchor. And although it is sometimes recommended to measure from the posterior glenoid to the posterior humeral, anchor, my experience has been that making it square is a perfectly reasonable option. As I mentioned previously, it is very useful to have someone who can write the measurements on a board. You then need to add five millimetres medial to the medial anchors, five millimetres anterior and five millimetres posterior. To recreate the footprint, you need to add 10 millimetres from the medial row glenoid anchors laterally. It is worth marking the position of the anchors on the graft and putting an arrow which indicates the superior surface as it's very easy to twist the graft as it goes in. The knotless system can be a little bit complicated to start with and it's worth spending a bit of time getting familiar with it before you start a case. The blue suture is going to be the one that passes through the graft and the black and white suture is the one that pulls the blue suture through the anchor. You therefore need to retrieve both the blue suture and the black and white suture that has a loop on it through the lateral working cannula at the same time. To create a mattress suture, work from anterior to posterior. Pass the needle from the scorpion inferior to superior surface, then unload and reload the scorpion, and pass the suture from the superior to the inferior surface. Pass the end of the blue suture through the loop in the black and white suture. To bring the blue suture through the anchor, pull on the other end of the black and white suture. This requires a steady pull until the blue suture is getting close to the anchor. To get it through properly, a series of short sharp tugs will bring it through. It is important at this stage not to pull too hard on the suture as you don't want to pull the graft into the joint at this point as it's not possible to back it out and you still have a couple more sutures to pass. Once all three sutures have been passed through the graft and the sutures pulled through the anchors you then sequentially introduce the graft into the joint. It can be quite tight the graft pulling the graft pulling on the through the cannula, sutures, but if you keep going gently quite tight and sometimes helping cannula, with a bird beak, but if it, it will it, introduce it itself will into the joint and ultimately will lie it flat on the glenoid. Occasionally to it is then just a matter of rotate pulling on the sutures the as it comes to obtain the, the tension that you want if this happens, and making sure the, the contact the is acceptable. By pulling on the you can look from the underside the of the graft at this stage it will de -rotate the graft to see if you've achieved what you right set place. out to achieve.
the humeral sutures are passed in very much the same way as you would do for a speed bridge rotator cuff repair. Apply a little bit of traction through the traction suture to get the right tension on the graft and then viewing from both the inferior and superior sides position the needle so that it is directly above the anchor or a little bit medial if you want to increase the tension. You can reference the previously made marks but I would not rely on them as they're often in slightly the wrong place. It is important to then manage the sutures once they've been passed, taking them out of the anterior and the posterior accessory portals as soon as you can. If you place a grasper around the sutures as they exit the graft, push down with the grasper and then pull firmly on the suture it will take up the slack between the greater tuberosity and the inferior surface. The lateral row is secured using the basic lateral row technique for a speed bridge fixation using two swivel lock anchors. If you do create a small loose flap at either the front or the back, this can be secured with the eyelet suture, but usually this is not necessary. The final step is to pass two or three sutures from infraspinatus to the graft in a margin convergence technique and tie these down. This completes the capsular continuity and recreates the force couples which are so essential for satisfactory results. When viewed from the lateral portal, the completed repair should see the glenoid secure, a complete margin convergence with no gaps between the graft and infraspinatus, and a well-seated graft over the footprint. If there is a defect between the anterior graft and the subscapularis, it may be necessary to put an additional suture to close that and increase the anterior stability. In summary, we know that irreparable tears in the younger patient are a significant problem and the treatment options are limited. Superior capsule reconstruction does appear to be a solution, but there's no doubt that it is not easy and there is a learning curve with the technique. My experience is that the results are mixed. It is very good for primaries, but not as good for a revision from a failed cuff and you should be very wary of undertaking the procedure in smokers. This technique is part of an evolution. The techniques and the graft materials are evolving and it is certainly one that you need to spend time in the lab practicing first if you're not to get into significant trouble during your first procedure in theatre. Thank you for listening. If you do have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me.